Good morning, everyone. This is Liz Brown. We will get started with the HR payroll conference call um, shortly. Just hang on and we'll be with you soon. Good morning, everyone. If you could, though, just chat in and let me know that you can hear me. We'll get started soon. Thank you. We'll start in about two more minutes.
Good morning, everyone. This is Liz Brown. I wanted to welcome you to the April HR Payroll Conference Call. Um, I sent the agenda out yesterday, and of course, as you know, the conference call is presented in audio and video format. It's being recorded. This will be posted on the OSC website, more than likely by the end of today or tomorrow at the latest. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. You can email me or call me. Um, we have a pretty good agenda today that was sent out yesterday. And with that, I will transfer it to Teresa Jeffries for the OMPA update. Good morning, everyone. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Infotype 9822. This is still a relatively new Infotype, so there's going to be a few things that we have to get used to that need to become part of our routine. It's the Related Experience Infotype, and right now we've discovered that it's not being delimited upon separation. And again, this is probably more of an education thing. People come to the Infotype, they're not sure what to do with it. When this presents itself in a separation action, be sure to highlight the tab and hit the delimit button. This is one when we come to it, we should not next record past it. These should only be active for active employees. It's counting the months of service. It doesn't stop counting unless you delimit it. It doesn't know that an employee would be separated, so if you are running reports, it's going to continue to give the employee service on your report um, if you're picking up the employee regardless of whether they are still employed or not. We have run reports and discovered that over 500 records exist out there for separated employees. We are not sure how we're going to clean these up. Uh, we're going to see if we have any solutions here in-house to help the agencies out. If not, we may need to send reports out to the agencies to have these records delimited. We will be in touch um, to let you know. But in the meantime, we'll not create any more errors and we'll remember to delimit this upon separation. You can refer to the job aid. I've included the link there for you if you need a handy place to refer to the link. The other thing with Infotype 9822 is we're starting to find a lot of these are being saved when folks are reinstating from LOA. So as you know, there's tons of actions, not tons, there's kind of a short list of actions, but there's a lot more reasons. So reinstatement is an action, whether it's a reinstatement from LOA or reinstatement from employment, it's still a reinstatement and Infotype 9822 presents itself with a reinstatement action. If you're reinstating somebody from LOA, you should next record pass this because this is not something that we would save just because somebody is reinstating from LOA. So what's happening is that folks are being reinstated from FML, this comes up, it's being saved, and what it does is it saves the infotype with a zero, and so it starts counting that employee's related experience as of that reinstatement date zero and then going forward. And I have Snoopy here, so I can remember to tell you all a story. So Snoopy, where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? I recall back in my DOT days when I first started working actions and I went through training and I remember saving epitypes, check and save, check and save, check and save. I remember it going through my mind as I was working certain actions. I don't know what this is, but I'm going to check and save. Uh, so I think that's kind of happening with the 9822. So we really need to get into, with all of our actions, thinking about the infotypes that we're saving. Don't just check and save. Look at the information and think, what is this really asking me? And if you, all, if you have any questions about any particular infotype, you know that you can always ask your Best Share Services representative or shoot me an email. Uh, get the word out. Um, I know in training we actually talk about this now, but only since the implementation of the new Infotype because it didn't come into existence when most of us, it wasn't there when most of us were trained, but we're catching the newer folks. We do have a question regarding the 9822. Um, apparently someone is experiencing that when they try to next record pass the 9822, the data is lost and a message comes up. 
is this going to delete everything in the action? I don't really understand that question. When you next record past an infotype, as long as you haven't entered any information, sometimes if you start to type and you next record past, it may say that something's going to be lost, but you're not trying to save that record. I think with this one, I might need the specific example of what you're trying to accomplish. So shoot me an email and that would, as far as everything with the action, the entire action wouldn't be lost. It would only refer to that one particular infotype. So shoot me an email, um, maybe with a screenshot, let me know what's, what's going on there. Another question we had on the 9822 is do we need to update the 9822 on transfer within agency when processing a PA action following an OM position transfer, or does the info type months remain on the employee record? Okay, it depends on what kind of within agency transfer you're talking about. Since you said following OM action, I assume you're talking about the transfer within agency reorganization, and we actually don't do that action anymore. We announced it, I don't know, a few months ago on a conference call. OSHR has deemed that that action is not necessary any longer. I will mention, though, that if you are doing let's say a transfer within an agency horizontal or something like that where the position number is changing, you would need to update the 9822. The 9822 is based off of position number and the position should match. The position of the 9822 should match the position on the organizational assignment and the months may not change. Um, you would have to keep in mind, you know, keep, keep in mind that your calculating starting months would be different if you're creating a new infotype. Obviously, keep that in mind. Um, but within agency reorganization, A is not necessary, and B, therefore, you would not need to save an infotype as part of action since you're not doing the action. I hope that answered that question. If not, shoot me an email. And we will get these questions and answers on the FAQ slide at the end of the presentation. Okay, now we're going to talk about a topic that probably should have been talked about sooner. Um, we may talk about it again. This is pretty important when this this doesn't hit every agency. I know it would have um, hit wildlife and DPS and the Department of Transportation. I'm sure there's some other agencies out there with law enforcement officers. If an action is not worked properly completely, there can be huge implications for the employee's retirement benefits. So part of an employee changing from just a regular SPA to SPA law enforcement, a big part of that is the retirement piece. And that happens within the action. It's not something that's automatic. So kind of right there, I just show you what I'm talking about. This is, you know, a lot of times Sometimes it can happen with a promotion, sometimes, um, you know, with a transfer, but a lot of times it's when, when these officers who have been training become sworn officers. If any of you who do this on a regular basis are laughing at me because what I'm saying sounds completely funny, it's because I don't do what you do, but I know they have to change retirement systems. Okay, so what I'm going to kind of go through because I don't know that we have the screenshots everywhere, so this is mostly going to be screenshots for your reference. But when you save, when you're going through, again, this could be a promotion, it could be an appointment change, it could be a transfer action. When, as part of any of those actions, if you're going from SPA to SPA law enforcement, when you save the planned working time, so even if the planned working time isn't changing, make sure you save it as part of the action, the pop-up box is going to come. And so it's going to, you'll save that, and it, it's one of those kind of like with the new hire action where it pops you up to the general benefits that's in the background. The important, the important piece is the possible sub subsequent activities. That you don't need to X out. If you X out there, that's gonna be where the mistake happens. So this, this actually has um, ramifications in this action. So you're not gonna close it out. You're gonna hit the green check. It's going to take you to the screen kind of again like when you're doing a new hire action 
nothing is really obvious here um, that something needs to change. So just like with a new hire action, you're going to select automatic offer and get offer. That's going to then take you to the screen where you would select enroll. And it's doing, it's kind of doing the thinking part here for you once you get to this step. It's telling you, I'm going to delimit uh, the teasers at a certain point and I'm going to add the employee to um, the Leors. And this employee uh, has the supplemental 401k also that needs to be added. There's certain DPS employees who would just enroll in the retirement part without the additional 401k. So the system knows based on the employee group and subgroup what plans need to change and, and how they need to be enrolled. So if you realize you've made it all the way through this action and you forgot that step, it's not the end of the world, but put in a ticket right away with Best Shared Services and our benefits team will help you. It's better to catch these, even if you think about the next day, put in a ticket. What's happening is we're going months and months and they're being picked up on a report or the employee just realizes it or, you know, you realize it, hey, their retirement's wrong. Um, and I've asked Darlene to kind of chime in here at the end to let everybody know exactly um, kind of a, the word that comes to my head is mess, um, what complications this creates. So, Darlene, if you don't mind. Hey, good morning, everybody. So, when this does occur, what ends up happening is we have to change the teasers and the Leors to the correct dates in which they should have been changed. And when we do that, the system will refund contributions as far back as we set that date, as long as it's within the current year. However, the system will only take the contributions on the new retirement plan for 90 days. So what happens is the employee ends up getting a refund of some of that money that they contributed into teasers, and it doesn't automatically roll over into that Lior's account. So the agency then has a form that has to be completed, and that gets submitted to Orbit. Um, our Orbit team here has some, some adjustments that they do on their end, and then Orbit itself has to manually move the creditable service months between the retirement systems. So there's a lot of manual work, a lot of additional people have to get involved in it, and it does get rather complicated. But the biggest issue is, is that the employee actually receives a refund of this money, yet their creditable service with the retirement system doesn't change. So then they now have non-contributory service, which has to be corrected when that form is done from the agency, the employee then has to give that money back so that it goes back into their account. And sometimes it's just really complicated when we're having to deal with getting money back from an employee that they were given in a refund. So if at all possible, when we can avoid this, it is better. Um, so just, you know, like Teresa said, open up a ticket with us if you know that it's not right and we'll go in and fix it and the sooner the better. Thank you. Um are there any questions right now about any of the slides? And if you didn't understand what Darlene was saying, that's the whole point. It's really complicated. So don't do it. <laughs> um, are there any questions right now? Okay. Uh, I am in training today, so I'm headed out. I won't be here at the end of the call. If you have any uh, further questions, um, either Liz can help you out or shoot me an email. And now passing along to Denny Cameron with payroll. Denny, Denny's last conference call. He's moving on. Better place. Good morning, this is Jenny. I'm getting my speaker up here. Um, yes, I I have um, put in my retirement papers. This will be my last um, conference call. I appreciate everything that I have learn from all of you out at the agencies and um, appreciate all the, the time and effort that we've been spending together over the last 10 years or so. I do want to introduce um, Kim Aldridge. She will be the payroll manager moving forward. She is now. She's been here um, since the beginning of the month. 
and I must say that she is uh, picking up very quickly, taking charge, and uh, moving forward. You will be in very good hands with Kim. Uh, Jennifer Pacheco, our uh, compliance and tax person, asked me to talk about uh, foreign national employees a little bit. Um, she provided these slides, so I'm kind of going to have to read them rather than know what they say exactly. <laughs> So, um, every state agency may employ foreign nationals, and foreign nationals are employees who are just not U.S. citizens. So, anytime you hire an employee that's not a U.S. citizen, um, there needs to be some special consideration. So, these people could be permanent residents, they could be visa holders, they could be DACAs, they could be asylees. Um, they could be under TPS, which is Temporary Protective Status, uh, refugees, et cetera. So if you're doing your I-9 and you find that the person is not a citizen, there are um, two info types that will need to be completed with information based on the information that they give you for their I-9. Um, and those are on info types 98 and 48. 94, I'm sorry, and 48. So um, over here at OSC, the tax compliance uh, team monitors or uh, this international tax navigator system called WinStar. And when they find someone um, is not a US citizen, they have a variety of steps that they need to go through to verify that the uh, employee is a legal, person in the state and has um, legal status to work. Um, so we do, we from payroll do give them a report based on the information that you put in the 94 and the 48. But as soon as you're doing that higher action, um, if you would let the, the compliance section know that you're hiring a non-US citizen, we can get that paperwork started sooner and get their um, taxation correct in the system. Um, most of these um, non-U.S. citizens will have special tax considerations, and um, some of them are exempt from FICA, some of them have to pay a higher federal or state taxes. And the sooner we know that and get them on the right track rather than having to go back and redo months and months of their previous payroll, um, that makes everybody's life a little easier, including your employees. So um, Jennifer's stating that the agency itself is responsible for timely reporting this. Um, they will need to assist getting the employee to fill out the appropriate forms and get them back to statewide tax compliance. Um, and that is, there's the email <laughs> there for the, um, for the team that handles that. And Jennifer Pacheco and Kathy Tolbert are both in that team, and that is their contact information at the bottom of the slide. I'm going to pass this on to Kim so you have an opportunity to hear her voice and get used <laughs> to that. Um, so already she has, um, discovered a little glitch that she wants to talk to you about. Kim? Hello, everyone. I actually didn't discover this glitch. It was actually Adam from DPS. So I would like to thank Adam for bringing this to, um, to our attention. Um, this is actually in the speaking system currently right now. Okay. In the speaking system currently right now, um, the, system, the system has four filing statuses for North, North Carolina State withholding. And the statuses are single, married, head of household or family, or widow or widower. Actually, our current version of the NC form only has singled or married filing separately, married filing jointly or surviving spouse, or head of household. Um, so currently, what we should not be using is widow or widower. So single should only be used if an employee selects single or married filing separately. Married should be used 
when an employee is um, um, selecting Mary filing jointly or survive, um, surviving spouse. And head of household or family should be used if an employee selects head of household. Any questions regarding um, the statuses in the system? Okay. Currently, I, I noticed when Adam did show me, um, we had a couple of forms out here. The forms were actually, um, the NC form that was being used was an old version. It's important when you, any type of tax forms, when you fill out tax forms, you need to make sure it's the current version that's being used. Uh, so the current version can be found at that link below. I gave it a little um, hyperlink where you could click on that link and it goes directly to the NC form. The current form is actually dated on it Web 18. And that is the current version. And that's the form that should be used or employees should be using to fill out at this time. Any questions? Okay. okay. Um, Randy is out today, so this is Liz. I'm going to do the time slide. We just have one slide. It's regarding retroactive changes to the work schedule rule on the Info Type 7. Um, we are seeing an increase in tickets for changes made to an employee's work schedule rule that are causing some problems. When an employee's work schedule rule is changed retroactively, you need to consider absences that have already been recorded in the system. So when the new work schedule rule is applied, it overlays any existing attendance absence records. And attendance records do not cause an issue because attendance type 9500 for work time can be recorded on any day uh, whether it's a regular scheduled work day or an absence day. Um, however, all absences that are already recorded should be reviewed to ensure they will remain on scheduled work days under the new work schedule rule assignment. So with the new work schedule rule assignment, if you have absences recorded on a regular off day, that's going to cause issues. So please be sure when you're doing any retroactive changes to work schedule rules to review the attendance and absence codes that are already coded in the system and make the appropriate changes. If you have any questions, you are welcome to contact Best Shared Services. I'll transfer this to Darlene Yost for benefit. Hey, good morning everybody, this is Darlene. So again, we just want to talk about the upcoming employment category status changes. So for the state health plan, again, I have here beginning with July's payroll. This is still technically a tentative date. We're trying to get all of this information into the system by June. So it'll be the old way through June's payroll. And then beginning in July, we'll be converting to these new changes. So beginning with July's payroll, BEST is no longer going to be deducting health insurance premiums from leave of absence for workers' comp with supplement or from the leave of absence short-term disability payments. Once an employee is placed on a leave of absence and leave without pay, including these, the workers' comp and the short-term disability, the, um, to continue participation with health insurance, they will need to submit those premium payments to ITDM. Employees will no longer be sending health insurance premiums to Best Shared Services. Uh, right now, currently, we're working on letters that are going out to all employees that are currently mailing in checks to us, and then we'll be working on the employees that are having deductions coming out of their workers' comp settlement and out of their short-term disability payments. So all of these employees will be receiving a letter in April and in May, letting them know that changes are coming and that ITDM will be billing them from um, that point forward. BEST will be running deduction not taken and leave of absence reports to identify these people that are in a leave without pay status. We will use these reports to profile the employee in the e-benefit system as either a leave of absence partially paid which means that the state or the agency is still paying the employer portion of the employee's health insurance and the employee is only responsible for the employee and or the dependent coverage. 
So some of these examples are family medical leave, workers' comp, short-term disability with more than five years. Um, the other profile that employees will receive would be the leave of absence fully paid. This means that the employee is responsible for paying the full cost of the health insurance premium, which includes the employer cost and the employee independent coverage. So these cases would be employees on extended illness, short-term disability of less than five years, a leave of absence other, and those types. Then eBenefits will transfer this information to ITDM so that ITDM can then bill the employee. The employee will then submit payment to ITDM and the employee will have the option to mail in a, a check or they will be able to have online access to pay through a credit or debit card. If the employee chooses to cancel their plan during the leave of absence with leave without pay, they are going to either need to go into the e-benefit system if they still have access to that. You know, when employees get the action for a leave of absence, it cancels their ESS access through um, our self-service. But if they are still able to get into the e-benefits, they can do their own qualifying life event um, for a leave of absence and cancel the plan or drop the dependents from their plan. If the employee does not have access to be able to go into e-benefits, they can either contact us or the HBR can contact us through his ticket and we will cancel that insurance coverage or the dependents, whatever the employee is choosing to do using that qualifying life event due to a leave of absence. This will need to be done within 30 days of the effective date of the employee going on leave without pay. So they can't decide six months after going on a leave without pay that now I can't afford my dependents to be on my plan and I need to drop them off. It has to be done within that 30 days of going in leave without pay status. If the employee does not cancel their plan using the qualifying life event for LOA and they don't submit a payment to ITDM because ITDM has already billed them now, ITDM will cancel their plan for non-payment. There's a huge difference between non-payment and the employee choosing to cancel for the LOA reason. So if the employee's coverage is turned for non-payment, the employee will not be allowed to re-enroll upon reinstatement and they would need to wait until the next annual enrollment to re-enroll. So again, this is different from the regular leave of absence. If the employee chooses to ter terminate their plan because it's too expensive or for whatever reason because they've gone in that leave without pay status and it's done within 30 days of going on leave without pay, those employees will be able to reinstate their coverage upon re um, or they'd be able to re-enroll in their coverage upon reinstatement from their leave of absence. But if their plan is termed for non-payment, they will not be. Once the plan is termed, the agency can submit an exception to the state health plan for re-enrollment, but the state health plan will require any missed premiums be paid before they will consider being that, having it reinstated. However, please remember that just because you submit an exception to the state health plan does not guarantee that that exception is going to be approved. So for NC Flex, Again, beginning with July's payroll, BEST will no longer allow flex premiums to be deducted from a leave of absence short-term disability pay. Um, <clears throat> it has been our practice to not allow flex premiums to be deducted from workers' comp supplement. However, on occasion, we do have a couple of people that have, have had that happen and we have allowed it. But uh, going forward, this is not going to be allowed at all. So flex plans are going to be just like everyone else who goes into a leave without pay status. They will need to pay those vendors directly during that leave of absence, even if they're on short-term disability or if they're on the workers' comp with supplement. And it's not mandatory to pay those premiums to flex, but they can if they choose to. They should be submitting those premiums directly to the vendors and it's indicated on that uh, continuation of benefits LOA letter that you can generate through the system. <clears throat> Once the employee is reinstated, they can re-enroll in any of the NC Flex plans that they had prior to their leave of absence 
if they choose to re-enroll. Um, but employees that have the healthcare flexible spending account, it is mandatory if they reinstate within the same calendar year that that flexible spending account also be reinstated. So now to talk about the exception process for the state health plan. All exceptions must be um, submitted electronically by an agency, HBR, or us here at Best Shared Services. Exceptions will not be processed if they are submitted directly from an employee. You can go to the link that I've provided here and um, um, to the right of the screen, you'll see a screenshot of the first page of the, the electronic form. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like now. They've recently changed this over the past couple of months. So um, if you haven't done one in a while, it may look different from the last time you did it. But you have to use this electronic form. And when you're completing the form and it gets to the section about the reason for the exception, please provide as much detail as possible. The state health plan needs to know exactly what occurred, why it was terminated, you know, whose responsibility was it, was the employee informed that they needed to make the premium payments. You have to include all of that information. Also include what plan the employee was enrolled in, the coverage level, whether it was employee only, employee family, or what, and then um, if they had or, need, or had the smoking credit at the time the plan was, was uh, terminated. The employee should be informed at the time you're doing the exception or before you do the exception that they will be responsible for paying all premiums that are due during the time that the plan had been terminated. So when you do an exception, the state health plan will only approve the exception back to the date that it was terminated. They will not allow a gap in coverage. So if the employee's coverage was termed three months ago, the employee will need to pay those three premiums before you submit the, the exception because the state health plan is going to verify with us that we receive those payments before they consider whether that exception can be uh, processed. Now, again, that is our current process as far as sending those payments to BEST. Once we convert to this new category status change for leave of absence, and employees um, are paying ITDM, then that process may um, change a little bit and we'll provide additional information on that um, when we get all those details worked out. But please, again, make sure you see my note here at the bottom. Just because you're submitting an exception for an employee and the premiums are paid, it does not mean that it, the, uh, the uh, exception will be approved. It is up to the state health plan um, to make that decision as to whether or not it warrants the exception to be approved. If the employee does send in those premiums and we receive that money and the exception is then denied, then those premiums will be refunded to the employee. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, employees, especially new employees that are coming in and getting their access to the e-benefit system in order to complete their enrollments. So newly hired employees should be set up with an NCID as soon as possible so that they have access to employee self-service through our HR payroll system and then they'll be able to click on the link to e-benefits and it'll take them into the benefit focus portal for them to do their enrollments. Very, very important that if you have an employee that is having an issue getting their NCID set up, do not let the employee wait to do their enrollments. They need to go ahead and call the Benefit Focus Customer Service Center and they need to complete their enrollments over the phone. It is very important that the employees go ahead and do these enrollments and not wait for that NCID to get resolved because the employee only has 30 days from their date of hire to enroll in their benefits. An NCID issue is not a valid reason for submitting an exception to the state health plan. The employee had 30 days to go ahead and call the enrollment call center and complete their enrollments over the phone. So the last thing I want to talk about are some NC Flex updates. 
So for the cancer and specified diseases, employees can now assign a beneficiary to their cancer and specified disease plan in the e-benefit system. There is a job aid for adding a beneficiary to the plan, and that's the link to the job aid. The employees with an email address in e-benefits were also sent an email with the job aid attached to it, and that email went out on March the 28th. And you can also go to the NCFLEX website and click on the link for the HBRs and then go to the archived emails and you'll see the email that's dated March the 28th with that job aid attached so that you, have, you can get to it that way as well. Benefit Focus now allows employees that have a reduction in hours that they can now drop the dental and the vision plan. This would be an employee that was working 40 hours and now they've been dropped to between 20 and 39 hours. And, you know, in previously, as long as they were above 20 hours, they were, it was mandatory that they keep these plans active. Well, now they're allowing these employees to drop those plans if they choose to because of the reduction in hours. The employee or HBR will need to contact Best Shared Services and create a ticket and we will have to use the qualifying life event for reduction in hours and drop that plan, those plans for that employee. <clears throat> Employees uh, that are reduced to less than 20 hours are not eligible for any NC Flex plans, so those plans are automatically terminated. So this is only if they're dropped between 20 and 39 hours. Okay, lastly, my last slide here is that NC Flex is now changing the Dental and Vision COBRA administration. Now this is for separated employees and it's going from the vendor handling these to Benefit Focus is now going to handle this. The target date for this change is May 1st of this year. Um, like I said, the leave of absence administration is going to remain the same. So an employee who has a dental plan on a leave of absence, they are going to mail those premiums directly to the MetLife vendor, IMS. This information is on the LOA letter that you can generate in the system or it's in the NC Flex Administration Manual. And for the vision plan, IMED keeps the plan active with no premiums due when the employee is on a leave of absence without pay. NC Flex is working on an article to send to HBRs with additional information regarding these COBRA changes, but that does appear that it's coming soon with that target date of May the 1st. So that's all I have for benefits. If you have any questions, you can type them in. We did have one uh, benefit question come in so far, and basically that question is for the LOA benefit changes that are coming with ITDM. Um, they state that our previous slides indicated that employees on leave of absence without pay will need to send premiums to ITDM and not best when the new procedures begin. There seems to be some confusion on this if it will just be employees on leave without pay, including short-term disability and workers' comp with supplement, or if it will be all employees on leave of absence, including the ones still exhausting their own leave. Okay, so this is going to be for the leave of absence people in a leave without pay status. If you are still exhausting leave and have sick leave or vacation leave that you are exhausting, you're still receiving your paycheck each month and therefore your deductions are going to come out as if you're still working because you're exhausting enough leave to pay for those deductions. So these changes are only going to happen once you go into a leave without pay status and you're no longer receiving any kind of pay from us. However, with short-term disability is that one exception. Um, we're going to treat all employees on a leave of absence without pay the same. That's why we're no longer going to uh, deduct premium payments out of short-term disability pay because they are technically on leave of absence, leave without pay. The short-term disability benefit is not the same thing as exhausting leave and therefore they are looped, um, into that group of people of being in leave without pay. And then workers' comp, um, you know, even those that are receiving the supplement, we're still going to have those, they're still considered on being in a leave without pay status, 
So again, those employees will pay ITDM for those premiums and it will not be deducted out of their supplement pay. So as far as the confusion of when this is gonna happen, I do know in previous slides, we have said we were looking at a June date to have all of this put into production. And we are still going with that June date, but we needed to have a solid cutoff date as to when we're gonna collect payments through a certain month, and then ITDM is gonna go from that point going forward. And so that ITDM has enough time to send out those first bills to employees, once it goes into our system in June, we determined that the June payroll would still, even though the system is going to be updated in early June, the June payroll is still gonna be handled the, the way we're handling it now. And beginning in July with August coverage, so you pay July for August premiums, the premiums paid in July are for August coverage, then that is the first month that ITDM will be billing employees for. So it's July's payroll paying for August coverage is the first month that the employee will pay ITDM for the employee portion. And again, this is only employees in a leave without pay status. They're not exhausting leave. Um, they may be getting short-term disability and they may be getting workers' comp supplement, but they're still in a leave without pay status. I hope that clarifies it a little bit. You can chat in any additional questions if you have any. We had another question. Um, can a copy of the letters that are you're sending to the employees be shared with the agency so that the agency is aware of what the employee is receiving? Yes, our intent is that all of the HBRs will be CC'd on all of the letters going to the employees. Now the employee letters will be mailed the HBR letters will probably be emailed to the HBRs. But yes, all HBRs will receive a copy of the actual letter that went to their employee. Another question, if employees are on short-term disability and they are separated due to unavailability and a separation pay continue action, continuation action is entered, will they begin their COBRA period at that time or will ITDM allow them continue to make payments as an employee on LOA? We're gonna to have to check on that. Um, I know currently what we do is we handle that employee as an, a still an employee, um, and we allow them to make those premiums to us. Once we go to ITDM, um, I'm gonna to need to verify with the state health plan how that's going to work out. So we'll make sure that that question is on the FAQs that are sent out with the conference call slides, and we will um, get an answer to that question. We have a question. If the continuation of benefits letter will be updated to include this new information. Yes, um, actually we have done the revisions to the leave of absence letter that is in the system. However, we've decided to not update that until everything else goes into um, the system in June and just to do everything together. We were afraid if we put that letter in the system too early that employees would get confused because the wording is a little different and the process is different. So yes, that letter is ready to go along with everything else when it gets into, put into production in June. Another good question, will agency post-tax benefit deductions from agency-specific insurance plans be taken from short-term disability payments or workers' comp supplements? The post-tax plans, they're agency-specific plans, and that is between the employee and the agency in how you're handling those. The agency plans are not part of this change with the, the leave of absence category status. So um, I don't see very many of the post-tax plans coming out of workers' comp supplement. Um, huh? But if they're not delimited and the employee has money in the paycheck, then yes, those deductions are still gonna come out. But that is something that the agency needs to manage. That's not something that we handle here in the benefits section. Yeah, I, I agree with Darlene. The uh, agency-specific deductions are managed at the agency. 
um, it's up to you and your agreement with your vendor as to how people with um, that are out on leave of absence are handled. Um, and if if the uh, the contract says that they should not be getting benefits while they're on leave of absence, the agency needs to delimit those agencies specific deductions. All right, we've had some really good questions come in. We haven't had any other questions right now. Um, again, our next HR payroll conference call is scheduled for May 21st. We have the link to those registrations here on this slide. Um, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to chat them in now, and you can also email us. The questions and the responses that we've given you today will be posted on our FAQ slide that we post on the, our website. Um, we did have some extra questions regarding the Infotype 9822, but Teresa Jeffries is no longer in the room, and I would prefer her to answer those directly. We will include those on the FAQ slide as well. We have not gotten any other questions right now. Again, if you think of something after the presentation, you are very much can email us and we will be happy to assist you at that time. You've got our best shared services contacts here if you have a specific payroll time, OMPA, or benefits question. And we look forward to talking with you next month, and I hope that you all have a wonderful, happy, safe holiday. Thank you.